The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Review modal analysis. I figured most, I've heard lots of students have had questions and you could use a little practice on this. So that's what we're going to do. Huh? Solving the key function. Yeah, solve, solving the whole thing. So, but let's start, I'd st still start with the usual concepts. I haven't even raced what we had last time, but this is what the students in the last group said about key concepts for the week. If you want to add something to it, speak up. But modal analysis, multi degree of freedom, transfer functions, and then modal analysis, more specifically, response to initial conditions response to steady state harmonic inputs. Anything else that was significant, conceptually new in the last week? I add to that. And then the second thing I add is, what are issues that are muddy for you? Not quite clear, things you want to learn a bit more about, have questions about last class was more on transfer functions for multi-degree freedom systems and solving initial condition problems is what one student was interested in about uh, from using modal analysis. Anybody, but do any of you have questions about things that you want practice on? Yeah. So I understand how to get the new mass and spring and whatever matrices for um, the Q system. So I mm -hmm. can set it up as the M Q, B, Q, K, Q. Um, right. But from there, I don't know how to go back and solve for X, or I don't know how to solve right. for Q. Right. So we'll go through that. We're going to run through a complete modal analysis today, all the steps that you need to do to make it happen. So anything else that you've got a question about that I might be able to get to? OK. Well, let's get rolling. This will take a little while. So the problem for the day is if you recall last time we had this demo of this double pendulum. But now we're going to take that double pendulum and make the masses unequal. So well the masses are equal here, but they could be unequal. M1, M2, they're each half a kilogram, but we're changing the lengths a little bit. 1.1 for L1 and 1.0 meters for L2. So they're slightly different lengths, and that'll make the system not symmetric, so it won't have 1, 1, and 1, minus 1 mode shapes. A little weak spring in the middle, possibility of having some uh, dash pot here connected to a, a uh, non-moving wall, another dash pot here, and the possibility of having harmonic excitations, F1 on this one, F2 on that one. The whole system's been linearized. The equations of motion look something like this. Mass, damping matrix, stiffness matrix. Of course, it has gravity terms in it, as well as the spring terms. And it's been linearized. And the whole thing, what, this, this equation of motion, is it, force, is it a force equation or a moment equation? Are they force or moment or both? You know, we can have mixed ones, like the cart. Problem with the pendulum has one force equation and one equation with units of torque. This one has units of what? Yeah, these are both. This is moments about point A and moments about point B give you the two equations. So this is a torque equation. So if you, look, you need to look and see if things inside here make sense. So the MGL, the nonlinear equation, the restoring torque is MGL sine theta. Linearized is just theta, so MGL1 theta is the torque on the first mass. M2GL2 theta is the torque on the second mass, and so forth. And K1L1 squared, why the L1 squared? And this term here gets multiplied by a theta 1, so what is that? What's K1L1 squared theta 1? What kind of a torque? What is that? Does it make sense or its units correct? So first of all, what's K1L1 times theta? Force. Yeah, it's a force. What's L1 times theta? 
Physically, that is what? That's the distance that that thing moves, right? And, and a displacement times a spring constant gives you a force. And then that force times a moment arm gives you a torque. So it makes sense. KL1 squared theta 1 is the torque about point A caused by a displacement theta 1, assuming this one is 0 when you do it. That's the, respond, that's the torque caused by a displacement of theta 1 only. OK. All right. So that's our equations of motion, linearized. This is the mass matrix. This is the stiffness matrix that you would get if you go into there and substitute in these values. Yeah? That matrix on the right with theta 1 and theta 2, is that just one term on the top and one term on the bottom? This one here, there, this is a 2 by 2 matrix. Oh, okay. And it has to be. It's a 2 degree freedom system. This is, this is K11, the K11 term. This is the K12 term, the K21 term, and the K22 term. Yeah, I got a little squeezed here. The space, there's a M2, G, L2, that shouldn't be squared, plus K, L2 squared. That's right. All right. I'm pretty sure that's what it ought to read like. M, G, L2, K, L2 squared. And then each of these are minus K, L1, L2, minus K, L1, L2. All of this, this will be, this is all in a handout which will be put up on the Stellar website. And just so in terms of you know, reviewing for final and things to go look at, for almost every recitation we've done this term, Professor Gosser, the other recitation instructor, has written up the complete problem that was discussed with its solution and put it on the website. So you don't even have to copy this stuff down. It's all posted. And those are really, you know, in each recitation, we've essentially done a problem that is the sort of the objective lesson for the week. So they're a good place to go review. So this whole problem is, uh, uh, it will be up on there. And we found a mistake, actually, on this. And I think, well, it'll get fixed before it gets put up. But I think this had a zero in here. And that's actually wrong. Or it was, something got transposed in writing. That's the correct mass. OK, so you, got, you have these numbers. We're not, they don't want you to work this stuff out because they want to focus on the modal analysis. So let's see here. I'm going to ask you a question first. So we're going to begin this. Yeah. Is there a torsional damper at the top of B? Uh, oh, I, we, somebody asked a question in the last class. And I wrote, drew that up there. But if you put a torsional damper up there, some CT value, what, how would it appear in the equation of motion? Would it have L1, L2 squareds in it? No, it would just, it would just appear as a plus a CT theta 1 or theta 2, wherever it's applied directly. Theta 1 dot. OK, first question. Write down on your piece of paper. So I'm not going to make you go to the board today, but you are going to, I want you to take a, few, a minute and write things down, and then we'll check and see if everybody agrees. The, the way, the reason we can do modal analysis is because of thing, something we call the modal expansion theorem. It's basically the fundamental uh, statement that says we can do this. So what is the modal expansion theorem? You can write it down mathematically if you want, just as a little, little uh, linear algebra expression, or you can write it out in words. So take 30 seconds and write down the, the, what makes modal analysis work, what basic proposition. All right, somebody help me out. What's the, what is the modal expansion theorem? What's it say? Any motion of the system can be 
described as a weighted sum of the natural modes? Weighted Which sum is. of the motions of the each of the natural modes. Okay. So that's the statement. The most succinct way to say it is in the original generalized coordinates, you can express them as U Q. All right. U is the matrix of what? No, the ma this is mode shapes, and the Qs are the individual modal coordinates, right? And so this expanded says that this two degree freedom system has two generalized coordinates, theta one and theta two. And the response of either of, of the actual motion of the system expressed in the generalized coordinates can be made up as the sum of each of the modal coordinates, the Q sub i's, scaled to the shape of the mode shape for that mode. So this multiplies the mode shape and that, so everything contributed by mode one will move in the shape of mode one and that will be reflected in the motion of the generalized coordinates. And you, in this case it's a two by two, it's a two degree freedom system. Here's the mode shape of mode one times Q1, which we're gonna solve for, plus the mode shape of mode two times its modal motion. Okay, that's the modal expansion theorem. All right. This allows you to, to, in order to do this, you have to solve for these QIs. So what is the equation of motion that governs the behavior of each of the modal coordinates? Write it down. What's the whole reason we do this? There's one particular equation of motion that every one of them satisfies. So equation of motion, not asking for solution. I just want the equation of motion that governs, the, 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 the governs these modal motions. I think I've got a minute to think about it. Okay, somebody help me out. What's the equation of motion that I can write that will describe the motion of any one of these modal coordinates? Q, I, Christina. With the fancy M's and C's and K's. Pardon? With the fancy M's and C's and K's. Well, yeah, but I, it's basically a very simple equation of motion, which you should be familiar with by now. What's it look like? For any one of these modal coordinates, what is the equation of motion that governs it? Why do we go to all this trouble? There's a reason for doing this be is because ah, the single degree of freedom oscillator equation, right? This is the reason we do this. Single degree of freedom systems are mathematically simple, and you've been you've seen them since high school. You've seen them in 1803. It's the second order linear differential equation that looks like this. And you, know every, you already know everything there is to be known about that equation. And that's why, one of the reasons why we do this. You don't have to solve a complex set of simultaneous differential equations. You just have to know one. And so the ith one, you need to know the ith modal mass, the ith modal damping, the ith modal stiffness, and the modal force. And we've, in this course, we've taught you how to solve Two kinds, of, two kinds of single degree of freedom system problems. One is response to initial conditions when their forces on the right hand side is zero. And the other is this steady state response to a harmonic input, some cosine omega t kind of input. So you, 
That's what we focused on in this course because it's vibration we're interested in. So we solved this equation for two kinds of problems. Now to do modal analysis, you need to be able to find these quantities. These we call the modal masses, the modal damping coefficients, the modal stiffnesses. And how do you get those? How, for example, write down on your paper what equation, what linear algebra thing do you have to work out to get the modal masses for the system? Let's say all of them. I want it's a two degree freedom system. What's the state? What's the math? The linear algebra you have to work out to get the modal masses. Somebody help me. What is it? Yeah. Transpose of the, of the mode vector, sorry, the mode matrix multiplied by the mass vector. Yeah. Um, and then multiplied by the mode matrix. Yeah. All right. All right. The modal forces are U transpose F. The modal masses, and I've drawn these little diagonal marks in here to remind you, these matrices become all diagonal when you do the modal analysis uh, coordinate transformation, I'll call it. So the modal masses are U transpose MU, and this M is a matrix, and it's the original mass matrix of the system. The modal stiffness matrix, U transpose KU. And the modal damping matrix, U transpose CU. But this one can be problematic. You have, to, you have to force this one to behave. These are guaranteed to behave. All right. So for this problem, uh, and I know some of you are a little rusty calculating these things. So there's the modal mass matrix. And here is the modal the matrix of eigenvectors or mode shapes of the system. U is made up of columns, and each column is one of the mode shapes. And this, the convention is to order them by the, from the first mode to the nth mode, where the order is established by the natural frequencies. The lowest natural frequency is first, second, second, up to the highest natural frequency. Anyway, here's mode one, here's mode two for this system. You have to once you have to choose a way in which to normalize the mode shapes. I choose to normalize them usually. I say I'm going to make the top element of them one, and I do that. Whatever if you run the, if you do MATLAB like you do, uh, there's a function called eig, which means eigenvalue. You do eig of a, it'll give you the eigenvalues of matrix A and it'll give them back to you unnormalized and unordered. Well, and so you can write a little program to put it all in nice order, but if, if, if MATLAB gave you back a, the mode shapes for, this, for a system, and it said, well, the mode shapes of the system are, and it's a two by two system, uh, two and 0.4 and 0.6 and 0.5. You know that the vectors are the mode shapes, the columns. How would you normalize those? How would you make the top element one in this first one? Divide, two. Divide what by two? The entire, entire column by two. Just factor two out. So this would become two over two and 0.4 over two. And you know that's one and 0.2. So you just normalize that vector so the top element is one. So you pick what, uh, you, do you have to normalize it? Could you use them this way? Sure. But once chosen, once the normalization is chosen, the key to doing modal analysis is you have to stick with it. You can't move, you can't mess with that halfway through or you totally screw up the solution. So you pick your normalization when you f calculate the natural frequencies and mode shapes. 
You pick a normalization and you must ride with that all the way through, including putting it back together again at the end, this summation. Okay, so let's do, I want you to do this computation. Calculate the modal masses for this problem. That means you have to remember what a transpose is. There's the modal, that's the modal matrix. And the modal mass matrix is right there. So actually, just do the arithmetic. Take a few minutes. Yeah? Um, on the exam, we'll have calculators. So, like, is it all going to be variables or? Say that again. On the exam? exam? We don't have calculators or anything. Uh, on the exam, we'd either make it so simple that you can, in fact, do it in your head or on paper, or uh, we won't ask the question that you have to do it that way. Or we'll accept an answer where you put it down, but don't have to multiply it out. So just do this one, just to see if you have the, remember the mechanics of doing the linear algebra to get that. OK, somebody have an, an answer for me here for the modal mass matrix. What's the first element? Somebody help me? Give me a number, and then everybody else can check you. Say again? 0 0.254. 0 0.254, OK. What about the second, this element over here? Speak up. Yeah, better be 0. What about this one down here? All right. How about this one? Okay. So, I, so did you give me the first? Did you give me the first one? So you're authorized to change this. No way. Okay, you got point what? Eight five nine. Eight five nine eight. And this zero zero. How about the second one down here now? Three point. Four A. Anybody else get anything different? So let's. Uh, we have six O oh, five zero zero and point five, and we're multiplying that. So if you're looking for just one of them, by the way, where did my eraser go? All you need is the one of the modal masses. The only ones that give you non-zero results is when you compute u transpose for mode R M U for mode R. So if you're only looking for this second one, you only have to do the calculation for that mode. So this then becomes instead of matrix, 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 you only have to do a couple of vectors. So this looks like for mode 2, it's minus what? Mode 2 is 1 and minus 1.6949 times 
point six zero five zero zero and point five times one and minus one point six nine four nine. So to get just one modal mass, this is M two. To get just one modal mass, now you only have to do that calculation. You only have to do one I can you only have to do the computation using one of the mode shapes. So it's this times that and this times that give you some numbers back. 0 0.605 and half of this about 0 0.8 and then you take that and multiply it again. Anybody, can you give me, somebody give you this second number? I have a 3.48. Anybody get anything different? Pardon? Okay. There are about 18 of you. Nobody can do this calculation. Say it again. All right, I have a two point one three. Two point oh. <laughs> okay. There you are. Okay, so if you were having trouble sorting that out, it's probably a good thing to go back and review a little bit, a little bit of your linear algebra. Okay, if you do U transpose KU, you get this. Yeah? And why is it that F, you have a multiply by F1, L1, not just F1? Okay, I'm gonna guess where I'm going next. So U uh, to get the stiffness matrix, U transpose KU, you get this. U we're going to leave the damping matrix for a minute. Uh, we need that. We need the modal excitations. So I'm just going to do a particular problem. I'm going to say let's let F2 be 0. We'll only have one force. And the first force will be F1 cosine omega t. And so now I need to do U transpose F. So here's U transpose. Here's the f's, and I guess I ought to keep my cosine omega t here. So you multiply that out, what do you get? Yeah? Why is f1 l1 though? Well, because f1 is just the applied force, but the equation of motion that we're working with, if you go back and look at it, what is the forces on the right-hand side? The forces are, have to be moments, right? We're putting a force down there. It's a moment equation. We need the moments about the pivot. So it's the force times L1, or a force times L2. Also, we don't have to use actual magnitude of force. We have to use water. You have to. You will eventually. You know, it, these kind of problems are easiest to do once you reduce them to numbers. I'm leaving the force in it as a variable at the moment just so you can see how it carries through the problem. But I'm just saying in the real problem, there, let's say there is no F2. There is an F1, and the F1 of T looks like a magnitude F1 times cosine omega T. That's the only force I have in the system, but we're working with equations of motion. And the equation of motion is the right-hand side F1, L1, and F2, L2. And you have to retain the L1s and L2s in order to have the correct equation of motion. So when we say, this is, this is kind of just a generic form. This is the modal force vector is the mode shape matrix times the modal excitations in the original coordinates. So I just wrote F here, but what this really means is this is F1, L1. And F2, L2. These are the real generalized forces in the system. OK? They're the real generalized forces. Now, I've let F2 be zero, so the real gen only generalized force is F1, L1, cosine omega t. I multiply that by U transpose to get, and what do I get? This is a pretty simple calculation. So this becomes F1, L1, cos, and F1, L1, cos. So the two modal forces are identical. Yeah? Uh, why do we know this one so we don't have to include a feet? 
in ah, well, the fee doesn't come out until the answer. The, the, what does the fee mean? What's that phase angle mean? If, when, if you remember, we're doing steady state problems in which F1, L1, for example, if it's cosine, is, we're just assuming it looks like that, right? And we're looking for a solution, uh, theta 1. And actually, can't, we can't quite go there yet. We're doing single degree of freedom problems, right? We're, we are looking for a solution for Q1. We turn this into a modal force, Q, but it happens to be that capital Q1, the modal force, is F1, L1, right? Cosine omega t. So we, that's the input. The output is Q, little q of t, the modal coordinate. And what does it look like? We're only doing steady state, no transients. It looks like a response that looks like this. But it's shifted. If this, I'll draw this so its peak is right here. It cosine is its mat. It's shifted in time by this amount between this peak is here versus the peak being there. And that we can represent as a phase angle. Remember, one period from here to here is 2 pi radians. So some portion of that period is an angle. You can interpret it as an angle, or you can interpret it as a time delay. And this then has the form of some Q1 magnitude cosine omega t minus that phase shift. So it's only, that's only the thing the phase shift means. Is cosine n doesn't mean exactly the response out's going to be exactly in the same, perfectly in time with it. It could be shifted. N now, you know that it re for a single degree of freedom system at resonance, what's the phase angle? Can you remember that? It's always one number. It's pi over 2. A shift of pi over 2, if you remember your trigonometry, takes you from cosine to sine, or sine to cosine. It's trying to tell you that the response is shifted by exactly a quarter of a cycle, pi over 2. And the reason for that is that at resonance, all of the excitation is going into overpowering the damper. And the damper's motion is proportional to velocity. And if velocity, if displacement looks like cosine, velocity looks like one derivative of it, which is sine. So it, that pi over 2 says it's that the uh, response, velocity, is in phase with the force. And that makes sense. Something I hadn't said in lecture, but I really meant to, is think, I want you to think about something here. Single degree of freedom system. Uh, well, we even write the one we're working with, m1. Q1 double dot plus C1 Q1 dot plus K1 Q equals some F1 uh, L1 cosine omega t. And I'm going to let omega e be at omega 1. But this is the equation of motion, right? Let's plug in. And we're saying we're going to do this right at the, uh, and we know the response of this is Q1 is some magnitude cosine omega t minus a phase angle. We know we can plug that in. We get minus m1 omega squared q1 plus k1 q1 plus minus c1 omega q1 1, and this one goes like sine omega t minus v. And this one here needs to get multiplied. This term gets multiplied by cosine omega t minus v. All right? You plug that into this. This term and this term both behave like cosine. This term, one derivative, behaves like minus sine. One derivative of cosine gives you minus sine, right? And when omega equals omega 1, so when you're right at resonance here, 
what happens, this is uh, squared. And I put I squared down here. There we go. So this is omega, but now I'm going to let it be right at omega 1. What is omega 1 in terms of k's and m's? k1 over m1. By the way, it's one of the checks you can make when you finish doing your modal, if you take that modal mass and the modal stiffness and you divide 7.96 by 0.8598, that had better be omega 1 squared. It's a good way to check that you've done all your arithmetic right. All right, I'm going to plug in omega 1 squared here equals k1 over m1. So I put in, this becomes minus m1 k1 over m1, which is minus k1, right? Hmm, plus k1. At resonance, this term accounts for the inertial force in the system, the force required to accelerate the mass. Remember, this is a force equation. This accounts for the force required to push the spring. Amazing thing, the thing happens is at resonance, the inertial forces exactly cancel the, da the spring forces. And the equation of motion reduces to minus C1 omega 1 Q1 sine omega 1 t minus a phase angle equals, in this case, F1 L1 cosine omega 1 t. So how to satisfy that equation? What phase angle will satisfy that equation? It has to be pi over 2. And if you put pi over 2 in here, this minus sine turns into plus cosine. And, and you're left with C1 omega 1 Q1 equals F1 L1. So all of the exciting force goes into pushing the dash pot. So that's, what, that's why you get the big peak in the transfer function. It takes no force to move the spring. It takes no force to accelerate the mass. They exactly cancel. And all the forces available to derive just the dash pot. All right? So... Let's move on to how do we need to get to our answer here. So the last piece of this is we've now know the modal forces and your assignment is to let's let uh, omega, let's see, where's my... I do this somewhere? I guess not. I guess I erased it. So we can pick anything we want. Let's let omega equal omega 2. So we're going to drive this thing at the natural frequency of the second mode. That's the excitation. What do you expect? Which mode do you expect to dominate the response? Second, second mode. Why? Because you are you are driving it. You know it's got a transfer function that looks like this, and you're driving it right here. And where are you driving the, if you're doing that, where, where are you on the transfer function for the first mode? Well, omega 2, it's a little higher than omega 1, but not a lot. So if this were the first mode's transfer function, where would you be driving it on this transfer function? If this is omega over omega 2, yeah, you're over here a little bit. You're driving it a little bit higher than the natural frequency of mode 1. This would be omega 2 over omega 1 on that transfer. So one's sitting here, one's sitting there. Which one's going to dominate? The big one, okay? Because they have equal modal forces. They both happen to be F1, L1. Okay, so um, how do you do that? So your la the last step in this thing is I want you to... Uh, for this, for this case, find the first, now let's do this, find the second mode contribution to the response in the original generalized coordinates. 
It'll often, a quiz will often be written this way. It's trying to make it easier for you. I'm asking for only one mode's contribution. What does that actually mean in the original statement of modal, the modal expansion theorem? We know the total response looks like this, right? I'm asking you to give me only the second mode's contribution. What am I asking for? Just this term. So I'm telling you, you don't have to bother with the other term to satisfy me. Just tell me what this one is. Because I know this is one that's going to be the dominant one. OK, so how do I do that? So for this problem, what is the steady state response of this due to mode 2 only? So mathematic, you know, just in, what's that look like over here? Just that second term, right? It's the modal mode shape vector for mode 2 times q2 of t. So you need to tell me how to find q2 of t. It's a single degree freedom problem, excited by steady state excitation. Word, transfer function. So we need the magnitude of the, this is a linear problem, so the response is linearly proportional to the force. force. So magnitude of Q1 times a transfer function that looks like the hx over f transfer function. In this case, we'd call it the magnitude of hq2 per unit q2. And that and that'll, that multiplied by, it looks like cosine, in this case, omega 2 t minus some phi 2. That's what we're looking for. What's this? Tell me what that looks like. Yeah. Thank you. So in effect, what's the transfer function? I want it, I want it in all its detail now. That's the magnitude of the force. What's in the numerator of this? Numerator. Well, it has parentheses around it because it's Yeah, it's in the denominator, though. I want just the numerator part. What's in the, this transfer function expression for a single degree of freedom system? What's in the numerator? One over which k? K2, modal k2. We're now in modal in the modal system. And in the denominator of that transfer function, what's it look like? One plus omega squared. One minus omega squared over, in this case, omega two squared squared plus zeta two. There we go. Now in this problem, what is omega? So that be what makes this a two, makes this a two, this term, what happens to it? One minus one. This term, this goes to one, this is two zeta, quantity squared square root, just two zeta. So this whole at resonance, any one of these single degree freedom systems that are at resonance, the response is the magnitude of the force, in this case that's positive, F1 L1 over K2 times 1 over 2 zeta 2. So F1 L1 is the modal magnitude of the modal force divided by K2 gives you the, what we call the static displacement of the system. And this is the dynamic amplification. So oftentimes in quizzes, you're asked to do the response at resonance because it makes all this algebra so simple. It just boils down to you know, 1 over 2 zeta. So the only thing left to do is you need a damp we need the damping ratio for the system. So rather than do that, so now that, we're missing something yet. We're missing that whole thing gets multiplied by cosine omega 2t minus a phase angle. 
what's the phase angle? Pi over 2. So Q2 of t is F1 L1 over K1, 1 over 2, whoops, F1 L1 over K2, 1 over 2 zeta 2 cosine omega 2t minus. And at the very end, how do we get back to generalized coordinates, theta 1 and theta 2? Right here. And we've computed that. This part, you multiply it by the mode shape. The mode shape partitions out the response in the right amount to coordinate 1 and the correct amount to coordinate 2. In, re in reality, what you do with, uh, with damping ratios is, you know, we're, you're working with real things out there in the real world. If you can, you go up and get the thing a kick and get your stopwatch out and say how many cycles does it take to decay and is it light damping or not. If it vibrates a lot, it's usually light damping. And if it's light damping, you can force this damping matrix. You can just make, force it to behave, even if it isn't perfect. And it is a perfectly adequate, useful answer. Even if it isn't perfectly diagonal, it just doesn't matter when it's light damping. And so in this problem, what you do is you go estimate the damping for the system. You say, ah, looks to me to be about 2% for mode 1 and 1.5% for mode 2. And you just say, how can I fit? The, how can I represent the damping in this system? And the, one of the easiest ones is to say that the original damping matrix is some alpha times the mass matrix plus beta times the stiffness matrix. And in this, prob let's, in this problem, uh, and, or you can use any part of that. And if you're, only trying to, if you're only trying to match one mode, see, in this problem, it's this system is being driven at the natural frequency of one mode. That mode is dominating the response, right? So we really actually only need a good model of the damping for that mode. Even if you have the completely wrong damping for the other mode, it will have little effect on its answer because you're not at resonance. When in the transfer functions, which look like this, at resonance, this happens. And you find out that the only force resisting the input is the dash pot. At low frequencies, you find out that over here, the dominant force is what it takes to move the spring. And the damping isn't very important. And so even if you're wrong by 50%, it just doesn't, 50% of a little bit compared to the, what it takes to move the spring is not a big deal. And over here, it behaves like the mass. Out here is called the mass-controlled region. Over here is the stiffness-controlled region. And in the vicinity of the peak, is the damping controlled region. So at low frequency, this term dominates. At high frequency, that term dominates. And at resonance, this is the dominant term. So in this case, let's let uh, the damping be some alpha times the mass matrix. Then when you do U, T, C, U, you get alpha times the modal mass matrix. And therefore, C2, which is the one we care about, is equal to alpha times M2. And we have M2, our modal mass, 0.204, right? So that says this is equal, C2 is equal to alpha times 2.04. And if I want, at, uh, that's C2, and how do I get zeta 2? Zeta 2 is C2 over 2 omega 2 M2. That's just the definition of damping ratio. I know this. I know this. So this is going to be alpha times 2.04 over 2 omega 2 M2. And I've measured it. 
you know, I've taken and I'd say, I know this is 0.02, about 2% damping. It's all for alpha. And you now have the, the whole thing that you need. You can now find, you, 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 that's, all, that's, that's all you need. Yeah? Where do you get the alphas and betas from again? Alphas and betas, where do they come from? This is a simply, this is called Rayleigh damping. Lord Rayleigh, 150 years ago, came up with this. And he just said, hey, by the way, if you model damping this way, you can automatically make the equations of motion U transpose CU go diagonal. And you have a two-parameter model with which you can juggle them to make any two damping ratios of the system be exactly what you want them to be. So it's just, you, if, you, if I'd left this as alpha and beta, then I would have worked this problem as this would have been an alpha m plus a beta k. C2 would have been an alpha m2, but now it'd be equal to alpha m2 plus beta k2. And then this still applies, except that it'd have this alpha and a beta. And you could do it for the other equation. You could do it for zeta 1. And you'd have two equations and two unknowns. And you, satisfy, you solve for alpha and beta. But think about what I just did here. If I make, made a measurement of the system, I said the damping for mode 2 is 2%. Do I have to go through all this junk? No, because no, I know the answer looks like that. All I have to know is what the damping is. And that's my approximate solution for the problem. This is just how to satisfy all the mathematics if you want that perfect mathematical model for which you can write out U transpose CU and get them. Well, this is one way that you can force the damper matrix to have the properties that you want it to. But in reality, you just measure the damping and put it in the answer. Very good. This is our last uh, go around at recitations. We'll see you in class on Tuesday. We'll do uh, something fun that's not covered on the final exam. I'll, I'll give a little review of what's going to be on the final, a list of what's on it. And we'll talk about strings and beams and things that apply to pianos and violins and so forth. <laughs>